So Long Gone would be an example of, of a groundbreaking movie in a way. It's a first, right, for HBO, but it's it all one of the very first movies HBO first. where they fully financed it themselves that they, yeah. instead of purchasing an already exploited and released theatrical film, they right. made their own. own movie. Um, and that started HBO on its way to right. uh, um, beat out all the other companies that That's they good. were, I forget the names of them now, but they were competing against a couple of other companies um, for who were showing theatrical films first online right. um, on cable and HBO was becoming dominant in that field. But once they made their own product yeah. and long gone was one of their very first yeah. and um, it, it, it hurt me because uh, I really wanted it to be released theatrically. And they realized Michael Fuchs, who's still a friend um, realized um, this is more valuable to us as our film as opposed right. to that we'd make some money for a movie yeah. that Orion distributed. And so uh, uh, that's how uh, uh, it didn't get seen by as many people because HBO didn't have the kind of following it has nowadays. You know, right. this was the very, very beginning of HBO when they, right. the subscribers were much more limited than they are now in the millions and millions of people. Well, so very few people got to see Long but even with, had, even with, it's amazing to me because the cast is like an A-list cast. Do you remember, you know, not yeah, that Billy really went on. He made a, he, he decided he didn't really want to work all that much after that. He did one or two other films, right. and then he did a series called CSI. He That's started right. in CSI, That's and right. he did that for I don't know how many years, five, mm -hmm. ten years, and then he decided I think that um, he'd rather go ride horses and he. Mm -hmm. I'm a very rich man, and I haven't. Nobody has seen him in really in much of anything since he yeah. walked away from CSI That's as a pretty true. young man. But he owns a piece of that show mm -hmm. uh, as the original guy yeah. who developed it, and so he's, um, I guess, happy. Right. Well, it's interesting. I'm th thinking also of D Dermot Moroney, uh, Virginia Madsen. I mean, those are, you know, I mean, I've, that period is an interesting period. Mid lady, mid to late eighties, you know. Yeah. Everything was sort of in flux, right, in terms of production. I love working. Virginia and I ended up doing three films together. Dermot and I never got to work again, but I loved him. This was kind of very early in his career where he right. played the young, the, the role that Tim Robbins played in their, in uh, uh, Rod Shelton's version of, uh, exactly. of this minor league baseball team. We were down, we shot down in Florida and he shot in uh, Durham, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, and at any rate, um, it, it, it was a wonderful experience working with those with those people. I loved every minute of it. And every day I get to go out when we weren't shooting scenes, I would go to the baseball fields where the or I had all the guys, most of them who I met that night before when uh, before, when I had been in Chicago and met Billy uh, and, and, and I was introduced to all these guys while drinking some uh, a lot of scotch. Um, yeah. I hired them all. They became my baseball players. I got the, them for five weeks to just go out and play baseball down in Florida mm -hmm. and they became real baseball players. Well, that's kind of like... Uh... You know that that's got. I think every actor's dream, right, to be that committed and to feel like you're, you know, owning the role. We had a, we had a ball because we all. Yeah. It was fun. It was an, an ensemble. It was uh, most of them had been in the uh, plays in Chicago, mostly Steppenwolf kind Steppenwolf, of yeah. actors. Um, and here we were having a ball, getting paid to make a movie where they get to go out and play baseball half the day. <laughs> so what's bad with that? Well, I want. I want. I'm, I'm trying to. I do eventually we're going to do our episode and bring in Lee Purcell and the three of us will talk. But I, I, I am so, as you can see, I have my poster way in the back. There's a little almost, almost summer poster back there of Lee Purcell. And I, I think that's one of the greatest movies ever. I think you, I think, I think almost summer is not only one of the best teen movies ever, teen high school movies ever, bar none. Just, just, um, I think it's just a terrific, terrific film. And just, um, it was an overlooked film, I must say, and I honestly did not see the movie. I, it's not that I 
avoid films that I made, but I rarely ever go back and look at films I made. It, it almost yeah. feels conceited to, to go back. I think I'll stay home and watch one of my movies tonight. So <laughs> I hadn't seen Long Gone. I hadn't seen Almost Summer, oh. honest to God, in 50 years. Wow. And um, I got a copy of it sent to me recently. Mm -hmm. Universal is re-releasing it. And I got, they right. sent me out of nowhere, I got 12 copies of the film. Yeah. So when I heard that you were interested in this movie and had talked to Lee and was possible that we would do something together, I said, I better take a look at this movie. Yeah. See what the hell this guy sees in it. So I was Am I right? that I agreed that I would do an interview. I thought it was going to be only about Omo Summer, and I hadn't seen it. And yeah. we watched my wife Sandy and I watched the movie together a month ago or something. Yeah. And, and we sat there and we felt silly saying, I really like this movie. <laughs> we had some one again wonderful actors like Lee, but we also I had an actor who again, who played the lead character, Bruno Kirby, who passed away much too young. Um, but what a wonderful actor, what a wonderful character he was, bringing oh, yeah. my New York sensibility to, to California. California, it was very yeah. interesting. Uh, that, that whole idea of it's, when Universal asked me to make a movie about, after I did, um, the Lords of Flappish, they wanted to do a, another movie about what it's like to be young and going to high yeah. school. And I said, I, I'm not really the best guy probably to do a movie about high school in California in the Valley or wherever. Um, I'm a New York guy. Yeah. And well, the more that they said, well, why don't you make it about a New York guy in California? That's Bruno Kirby. <laughs> and okay. Yeah. Bruno and his sister, their family moves mm. from New York for whatever reasons. No one really has to know. His father yeah. wants to move to California, but here they are transplanted in in, in the valley. Um, yeah. And once we did that, then I said, okay, I can make this movie. I, I'm comfortable with this fish out of water because that's what I am. That's I'm right. a fish out of water making a movie about what it's like to be in high school in the valley. But we had a great time doing it. Uh, we just put together again a wonderful group of actors, and I got very lucky also because uh, I wanted what could be more of a California sound than the Beach Boys. Sure. sure. So I set out to um, bring the Beach Boys in because to me, music and movies means means so much to me, and so. Sure. I, I I sought out the Beach Boys and I reached Mike Love. That's right. That's right. And Mike couldn't make a deal with me for the Beach Boys, but he said, "We'll come up with something else." Mm -hmm. And I said, "But will I get Dennis? And will I get? I need Brian. Well, mm -hmm. Al. Well, I need the Beach Boys." He says, "Yeah, but we have a deal, and I can't." get the Beach Boys to do right. the music, but I could get the guys who make up the Beach Boys to do it. Yeah. And I said, I'll take it. And at the time, Brian was going through a very, very, yeah. very, very yeah. difficult yeah. period in his life. And we ended up doing the music over a long period of time up in um, Montecito, up in yeah. Santa Barbara, where Mike had his um, home kind of mm -hmm. a state at the end of overlooking the, the Pacific, this wonderful house. But he had built um, bungalows, a series of bungalows, three facing three. So there were six bungalows and a, and a, and a horseshoe driveway in between oh. them. And when and the, the Beach Boys, the guys, the brothers, the relationships were with Dennis, they were all going through because of drugs. They, it was the drug period, think of it, 1975. Oh, yes. And, um, so they were all going through their own experiences and to get these guys together. So we shot, we were going to do all the music up there and I'd go up and go to stay at Mike's home. And then I'd get a car a limo. To right. pick up each of the guys, they lived about 30 feet away from each other. And we'd stop in front of each cabin and pick up the guys and take them yeah. up to the recording studio with a, where we Mike found some guy who built a recording studio up on that. He, he was from, I think, the 
Hilton Hotels or something. Some yeah. young kid who wanted to be in music, so he built a perfect studio up at his sound studio up in his house. So we recorded all the music there in Santa Barbara. But I couldn't get Brian to come with us. Mm -hmm. Brian had to come later. Mm -hmm. So we would lay down all the tracks and mm -hmm. and all the all the layers on top of it and start adding the voices to it. And when we had everything, we'd send out word that we were ready for Brian to join us. Yeah. Or we'd go down and get him and we'd make sure we always had things like wonderful pizza and, and hero sandwiches and things because Brian was always hungry in those days. He's putting on lots of weight. And he really was going through all kinds. And we'd lure him there with food. Right. And, you know, kind of, uh, well, you can imagine what it is. Like you smell it. You can uh, hear it is. You want some of this? And Brian would come up, and then he, we had just a stand up keyboard for him. And we'd play back all the layers of music with the overdubs of, of background singing. And then he'd sit there. Mike would get him to stand in front of his uh, keyboard and he'd just mm. stand there and he'd start and he'd go bum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, yeah. ba -dum, ba and all of a sudden it became the Beach Boys. Right, right. And then he, Brian would have a little something to eat and we'd somehow mm. convince him to do one more layer on top of it and he'd say, yeah. well, I'm tired after one after working for three minutes and eating for three minutes. And he we'd get him usually to record over himself and we'd get two layers of Brian and we had our soundtrack. It was an well, it, it sounds like making the music for that was as, as involved as the shooting as production schedule or shooting shooting the shooting the, the picture yeah. right a little bit, right? Yeah. In terms, of, uh, in terms of the intricacy of that. Yeah. No, but it was a great experience getting to work with the Beach Boys. Who gets to yeah. do that? <laughs> It's um, and the script too is great. The Bergs, right? Well, you were Sandra. What happened was it was interesting. That what happened was, um, Ned Tannen, who's head of Universal at the time, uh, after he he developed a thing with Motown, uh, that the Berg sisters had written a script uh, about um, the story of high school kids set in California. Um, I came in. I read a piece in the New York Times by Joyce Maynard called Senior Prom, something about- That's a, a wonderful, I should say, that's a wonderful piece of writing. I mean, that's one of the classic- Which, to Joyce Maynard? Joyce Maynard, Maynard piece, yeah. Okay, so yeah. I, I like that. And I made a deal with the Universal yeah. to develop that. So Mark Rubell and I wrote that. Then when the push came to shove and the, we both handed in separately, but equally, Rob Cohen and Barry Gordy handed in their script by the Berg sisters. And I handed in Steve Tisch and I, Steve mm -hmm. was my producer, wow. Steve Tisch and I handed in our script. Interesting. And then Ned Tennant didn't know what to do. He had two high school movies and he, one was set in New York, one was set in California basically. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to offend Barry Gordy right. and he didn't want to offend Steve Tisch. Right. And so he came to me and said, would you combine them? Yeah. And I said, combine? That's when I came up with the idea, okay, a New York guy in Brook in California, I could do well, that. Only, and that's how that came. I, I merged the two scripts. Well, into you one. have a, yeah, because you also have this great uh, soul group. You know, the, the, the girls in the film have, they're doing with Very good. Very good. Very good. Blues. Blues. Yeah. Blues. And it's all in one movie. Yeah, and you have Thomas Carter, and you have so I mean, it's just uh, Thomas went on to have a wonderful career yeah. as a director. Tim yep. Matheson, um, mm -hmm. I love Tim Matheson mm -hmm. and uh, David Wilson. And did, you, did, you, did you do a similar type of rehearsal on that as you did on Flatbush? I always do, you always I, do. Well, not, not nothing like the Lords of Flatbush because of time. The Lords of Flatbush, we had no script. And I was making it up through improvisation and going each night after improvisation, I would type it into a script form. And it took me seven weeks to do that. Okay. On all my other films, I always ask for and get two weeks of rehearsal before we start shooting. A lot of directors don't like rehearsal. That's right. They don't like it because their argument to it is, well, a movie takes 10 weeks to shoot, 12 weeks to shoot, sometimes 20 weeks to shoot. Why would I want to rehearse a, a scene now and not shoot it for 18 weeks? My feeling is it depends on how you rehearse and what you want out of your rehearsal. I'm not 
rehearsing the way I would do a Broadway show where eventually after the rehearsal period, I walk away and the show lives on its own. To me, rehearsal is all about talking and sharing and experiencing and improvising and finding out the depth and layers of the characters and their relationships. That's all I want. I don't care about the scenes. I hardly (laughs) ever do rehearse a scene that I'm going to shoot. It's a relationship. So what I you really will, I'll finish with this last yeah. note. What I like to do is I like to rehearse the scene that takes place just before the scene in the movie mm-hmm. so that if somebody is going to knock on their door, I might want to do what happened to that guy on his way to that door. Was he on a bus? Did he meet someone on that bus? What is he entering the room with? What is, what is he bringing to it? So that when the scene starts, there's a history and it's a continuation. Mm-hmm. I love to explore the parts that aren't in the script. Because mm-hmm. that does that prefer, prepare the actor for what they're going to do, right? So they're, yeah, they're it's, living it's, the part. Just enjoy it. They, I've never run into an act, one actor. I think Treat Williams. He Treat did not. I did a movie with Treat. He did not like sharing. He he, he liked doing it on his own, and it was so one of the. The only actor I say I, ever, I love Treat, but he didn't want to um, rehearse. He was not not into rehearsing. Everybody else loved it. Well, because it sounds like you don't rehearse like other other. You have your own. It sounds like you got rehearse the way I do. The way, way you do, and, that, and they, I think actors like that. So, um, were you surprised that it be ripped off yet again? I mean, in the way you talk about being stolen from. I mean, I mean in a mild way, but if you, all these movies like Fast Times at Richmond High and and no, well, actually, I feel like a lot of it, High school movies and you know on, on ensemble movies about young people right. took uh, took flight. They did. Um, you know to the, the whole experience of uh, you, you look at Henry Winkler how yeah. how that came to be um, for him the funds where that came from it came from your movie right I think well what happened was when I finished making. Um, the Lords of Flappers, we were trying to sell it to the studios. So we got to show it to all, all the studios. And uh, most of them thought that it they might have liked the movie, but they didn't think it would necessarily play across the country, that it would play outside of New York and Los right. Angeles, per, maybe even never outside of New York. Also, it was shot the 16 millimeter and we blew it up to 35. It wasn't something that studios were comfortable with. So when I showed it to um, Mike Eisner, who was head of Paramount at the time, he really liked the movie, um, but um, he really didn't, wasn't sure that it would play across country. At any rate, he was making a T, he also had a TV studio at the time, Paramount Pictures, and he was making uh, something um, based on, basically mostly the American graffiti, which had come out six, six months before us. Um, he had just seen our movie, and he, they were making this TV series with Ron Howard, and uh, you, you know the, the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Right? So he, making the, they, he saw the pilot. What? Happy Days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy Days. So he saw the pilot of yeah. Happy Days when they finished it, and he said, it's too white bread for me. Mm-hmm. So he was unhappy with it. So what's his name? Who ran? Who 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 show us it? Uh, Happy Days. The producer. Gary Marshall. Yeah, Gary Marshall. Mm-hmm. He, he says to Gary, "It's too white bread." And Gary says, "It's was, was making a movie set in Wisconsin or somewhere. What do you expect it to be?" He says, "I need somebody else. I need somebody else." He says, "I want you to take a look at a movie I just saw." The other day, it's called um, The Lords of Flatbush. Mm-hmm. And there's an actor in there that I want you to meet. And I want you to put a character in for him to play. Yep. And his name is Sylvester Stallone. Okay? Sylvester Stallone. That's who I want you to put into Happy Days. Mm-hmm. He said, but we finished shooting it. He says, I'm going to give you the money. And you'll go back and shoot a couple of scenes with Sylvester Stallone, some New York guy on a motorcycle. Right. So Gary looks, he calls up Sylvester Stallone's agent. 
who, or who found Stallone. I don't even think Stallone had an agent at the time. He was broke living in Lexington Avenue in New York above, above an abandoned uh, delicatessen. His, his wife at the time was working as a, in a theater cinema one over on Third Avenue to support them. And, and Sly was writing. He was writing screenplays. He wanted to write screenplays. And so they called, they got to Sly, and he decided he wasn't going to even go in and meet, but he said he would. If they came to New York, he'd meet them. Gary Marshall had to come to New York to meet Sylvester Stallone, who had only done the Lloyds of Love to, to, to play this character. And Sly met with him, talked, and supposedly from Sly saying, when he left, he says, so here's the deal. Here's what he says, let me slow you down. I'm going to pass. He says, you're going to what? He says, I'm going to pass. I don't do TV. He says, well, why did you have me come? He says, you wanted to meet me. I figured I made it. Hear what you got to say, but I don't do TV. Yeah. And Sly left to go back to his apartment above a delicatessen. And so Gary had to call Eisner and say, he don't do TV. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, so to him, then get one of the other ones. And that was we called up Henry Winkler, who was in California doing small parts on Mary Tyler Moore show right. at the time. And he came in and he said, Well, Henry plays in the Lords of Flatbush, the educated guy who's going to go to college who wants to make something of his life. Butchie is uh, he's so like, he's gonna go to see some Jewish kid school. from Brooklyn who's uh, who wants to go to Pratt, you know, to study, right. to be somebody. And he says, So Gary said to him, uh, can you do more what Stallone's character does. And he says, hey. Yeah. And he said, you got the part. So they they went back, shot a couple of scenes with Butchie, now playing uh, <laughs> just what they ne they needed. And amazing. it's history. You're, you're a great storyteller. That's amazing. I mean, I, I you're thinking, well, thinking about that, of course, it's funny, Sylvester Stallone saying, I don't do TV and... It turns out he has the biggest hit with his own independent film, Rocky, right? That was his independent film. Yeah, well, how he got so, that. So maybe he knew something. Maybe he had instinct that he had something around the corner. That No, yeah. but he eventually got it made, and he wouldn't, they offered him lots of money if he would let yeah. Ryan O'Neill or Jimmy Conn play Rocky, and yeah. he wouldn't let him do it until yeah. finally, the, the end of the story really is when they finally agreed that uh, if they didn't hire Sly to play Rocky, they weren't going to be able to make the movie. The, no. it brought, the Sly wasn't going to do it. So they called me up. Mm -hmm. Sly called me up and said, the guy, I, we've convinced everybody here, I think in California, that I could be Rocky, but they got to get approval from United Artists Head in New York. Would you show, I had the only copy of the film. I had been traveling with it at the time, right? And he said, would you show the movie to the guy, to the head of uh, uh, United Artists? So I said, yeah, sure. So I drop off the movie at mm -hmm. the, they don't want me there. I have to drop it off and pick it up later. So I drop it off at their offices on Park Avenue, 57th Street. And supposedly as the story goes, I forget the guy's name who ran uh, United Artists at the time. He was an old timer. He was uh, probably in his 60s, that old. <laughs> at any rate, he was there with his young assistant, who was a, uh, a very soft-spoken young man, very proper. And the two of them sat in this darkened room, and they start rolling the Lords of Flatbush. Yeah. And after about five or ten minutes, the head of the studio says, not bad. And his sister said, yeah, no, not bad. And he said, he's not bad looking. In fact, he's kind of good looking. And his assistant said, yeah, I think he's very good looking. And he's got some talent. I think he's got a lot of talent. You know what? That's who they want. I've seen it up. He, shut, he walks out. He says, they can have him. He was looking at Perry King, who was Chico. He thought that's who they were talking about. Yeah. Sylvester Stallone <laughs> wasn't the guy that he was looking right. at, and that's how we got to do Rocky. I mean, that's that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> if you think about um, the entirety of your career, is there anything that, of course, these stories are great stories. Is there anything that stands out in your mind that, of the most 
maybe memorable or most uh, important or anything you want to share with the audience that about your feelings about film as a medium or about anything that comes to your mind just out of the... No, the, 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 the memory that I have from a 50-year career doing films and whatever is that, that Lords of Flatbush situation from the time that uh, Steve Tisch, who was an executive, that's how I met Steve, was a young executive at Columbia, convinced he, he, he convinced David Beagleben and Peter Gulba that they should buy the Lords of Flatbush. And within four to six weeks from that day where I was penniless, I had worked on the Lords of Flatbush for three years wow. and hadn't earned a dime. We didn't get paid. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I had enough money when I started the movie. I think I had about twenty or thirty thousand dollars savings mm -hmm. in the bank. I was totally penniless. I used every dime I had. And I was living in an apartment over on East 55th Street, Manhattan, and they decided to open the movie at a hundred in two theaters the first night, the first weekend. And one of them in my local neighborhood theater, the uh, the Baronet over on uh, on Third Avenue, Fifty Eighth Street. Mar Marty, guess where I saw it as a six-year-old? I, I was at that theater. I saw that in New York. That I saw. I saw it as a little boy. Okay, it's 1975. Remember? Yep. Okay, yep. so they decided. I live on 55th Street. It's opening yep. on 58th Street. My local neighborhood theater is now yep. going to appear there. And so on that Friday night, it was a warm night in April, I think. And I said to Sandy, my wife. Let's take a look and see if anybody's coming to the show tonight. So we got dressed, walked from 55th and between 1st and 2nd down to 3rd, made a right turn, walked towards 57th Street, across 57th and heading to 58th. There was a buzz and the, there was a sound in the air. I could hear it. There was an electricity being in New York on a Friday, on a beautiful night in yeah. spring in 1975. Mm -hmm. And as I'm going closer to the theater, in those days, there were four theaters there, the Baronet, Carnet, Cinema One, Cinema Two. Mm -hmm. And as we got closer, there were lines around the block all the way up 58th Street for a movie. And they had ushers in those days who would line the people up outside the theater. And they wore little hats and little uniforms. They were ushers. Right. You knew who they were. And there would be ropes where the people would gather behind. Once they bought their tickets, you'd wait online until the show, previous show breaks. And then you go in for the 7 o'clock. And then you go in for the 9 o'clock. But they'd line up. And as we got closer, and I saw this line all the way to 58th Street, mm -hmm. all the way down to 2nd. Second Avenue, and I walked over to the usher, and I said, there were four theaters there. Who are they here to see? And he looked at me and said, with a shrug, the Lords of Flatbush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went to my knees, this little 17 millimeter film blown up to 35, mm -hmm. cost $160,000 to me, was now in my favorite theater, and that line was there. And I said, are you sure of it? He says, yeah, it's a different crowd. And I mm -hmm. said, well, in a different crowd, he says, well, between you and me, he says, see, across the street from us is Bloomingdale's. Yeah. We usually get what's known as the Bloomingdale crowd. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What we call this crowd <laughs> is the Bridge and Tunnel crowd. Yeah. I said, what's that? I'd never heard it. He says, yeah. well, that means they don't live in Manhattan on the east oh. side. They come from Brooklyn and Queens. Right. They take the bridge or the tunnel to get here. It's a whole new crowd. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how my career started that that's night. That's that's incredible. I mean, of course, that that movie is universal. It's not just a New Yorker movie. I mean, New Yorkers. Uh, I'm okay, curious. so now you know it all. Okay. I like, I like to thank you for your generosity and time, Marty. Mm -hmm. And we will we will return with Lee Purcell and discuss almost summer in more detail. Oh, okay. In the future. Very Thanks. well. Thank you very much. Thank you.